So coming back to this, you know, let's just, if we increase energy efficiency, this increases this feedback loop, and we actually get something called super exponential growth in that case. And that leads to ever accelerated increase of carbon dioxide emissions. So to come back to this plot right here, um, one can actually calculate this based on observations, this, this rate of, this feedback loop, this rate of return in the system. And the rate of return in the system is here, this purple line. And the rate of return here is the ratio of the GDP to the wealth. So what you get back from the bank and relative to what's in the bank. And as you can see, this purple line has increased from about 0.1% per year in 1700 to 2.2% per year. So the current rate of return of civilization. Two, that's a real rate of return of civilization. Based on our wealth, we get 2.2% per year back as added wealth. Higher than it's ever been before in history. And there's neat to think here as you look at that, there's inflection points in this. One around 1880 and one around 1950. And it's, fun to think about what might be physical reasons for why there are these inflection points. And I imagine that they're perhaps associated with discovery of new energy reservoirs. So that fundamentally this problem is a geological problem uh, rather than a societal one. So perhaps this is Saudi Arabia and I don't know, I think of the you know, discovery of this is when oil was first started being used in civilization. So maybe this is just inflection points associated with discovery of oil. Anyway, there is this rate of return. And, and a key point here is that the rate of return is actually is stopping increasing now. It seems to be stagnating in recent years. And it's stagnating really for the first time since about the 1930s. And so I wonder if this is related to the current economic crisis that really is a representation of the rate of return has stopped increasing. Between 1950 and 1970, it was just going gangbusters. It was increasing faster than it ever had before. It had a doubling time of just 20 years. But since then, things have sort of slowed down a bit. Anyway, what that means is that we can make predictions for the future, and this is really my final point, that if the, this, rate, this feedback loop is actually stagnating, then we can actually perhaps make a forecast and assume that this rate of return is just going to hold for the foreseeable future. And here, what I've plotted here is I put this into a simple model that you can just run in MATLAB. I um, assume some sink for atmospheric CO2 in the atmosphere. That's based, it's 1.7% per year uh, for the atmospheric perturbation for um, sink into the oceans. Um, that seems to work very well, actually. It's very simple. It's just a very simple linear couple model. And make forecasts into the future for various scenarios. Um, so the forecasts here, this is uh, observations up to the present. And then I just run the model for CO2 versus gross world product. And this goes out to 2050, and that's this part right here. And this is 2100, so it's sort of a phase plot really out here. Now the business as usual, I guess you could call it scenario, which is that the growth rates, that rate of return isn't changing with time. And we have no decarbonization. We aren't really decarbonizing. Perhaps we're trying, but we aren't really. And so we just assume business as usual. And that puts us up at about 2100. Uh, well, much higher GDP, about 10 times higher. And an atmospheric CO2 of, well, about, I don't know, 1,200 parts per million by volume, which would mean a very high rate, very high um, increase in surface temperature. So something perhaps unbearable. Um, and I think, you know, you look at this, well, that's meaning that GDP is growing at 2.2% per year. And, you know, that's perhaps acceptable. But, uh, yeah, I mean, I think you look at this, and you think, well, you know, something's obviously wrong here. We, we can't have a gross world product of um, $300 trillion per year when we're at $40 trillion per dollars per year right now and have a temperature rise or something like this. Uh, something's got to give. And, you know, you can think, well, you know, what's going to give in this case? Uh, now, something's missing from the model. And I, I, I don't know how to do this yet, but you can imagine, well, maybe the wealth growth rates, maybe the CO2 is fundamentally like a disease on the system. And if it's like a disease on the system, then perhaps the wealth growth rates will fall. So let's say 
they have in just 50 years. So in 50 years, the wealth growth rate, or the GDP growth, is not 2.2% per year, but rather it's 1.1% per year. Well, that would put us still at something that's a rather high atmospheric CO2 concentration by 2100, and even by 2050, a rather high CO2 concentration. And it also implies that we would sometime before 2050 enter a point where GDP is decreasing, which I would you could imagine this like a permanent depression in the economic system. Or you could decarbonize. Well, maybe decarbonization might work. I think I messed up these lines. Uh, this should be 50 years right here, this thin line right here. So let's say we have, we switch to non-CO2 power supplies. We have our carbonization in just 50 years, which is you know, ridiculously rapid. Well, that would still put us at very high CO2 concentration um, at this point, with perhaps very high uh, atmosphere, uh, sort of temperature rises. So, you know, with the high GDP. Or maybe it's some combination of the two, which we have wealth growth and carbonization in 50 years, do both at the same time, and that puts us on a curve like this, which would keep us under 500 parts per million by volume, but um, it would be associated, of course, with a depression. I know, it doesn't look like there's any particularly good ways out, because these are really the only options that are available, at least the free parameters in this model. So I think, you know, in the conclusion, I mean, is it possible to decouple economic wealth from carbon dioxide emission rates? I think the answer is no. It's just simply it's not, unless there is very rapid decarbonization. But then you have to ask the question, well, you know, wouldn't that be extremely expensive? So, I mean, if it's expensive, then no. I mean, I think I was stuck. And I think, you know, if basically this is just an interesting physics problem, even if it is, it does have practical implications. And what I'd like to continue thinking about is, you know, how would you model this perhaps a bit in a bit more sophisticated way. And I think fundamentally you think the growth of civilization, if it's an organism, it's dependent, it's, it's, it's a function of the availability of the energy supply or the size of geological reservoirs. And you know whether we grow into these new reservoirs or we don't, or we're going to deplete these reservoirs. And there may be environmental forces too that inhibit our capacity to grow into these reservoirs, perhaps due to increased carbon dioxide concentrations. And I think in that context, it's uh, interesting to think about whether civilization's growth is fundamentally what you, we would call a deterministic problem. Maybe we can't predict the future based on what we know, but it is fundamentally something that can be modeled as any other physical problem using uh, differential equations subject to initial conditions. And, you know. So I'll leave it at that. And thank you. Professor Garrett will take questions for what's been a remarkably stimulating discussion.